Hello everyone, I'm Steven and you're watching Steven Love Science. And in today's video, I'd like to talk briefly about seizures, their causes, classifications, and what you can do to help if you see someone experiencing one. And I want to talk about seizures today because I had a very unsettling experience this morning. So during my American history class, we had a substitute teacher, a very nice young lady. And we were having a great conversation, we were all talking to her, and then suddenly she froze. And then she shot back, became very stiff, and then shook uncontrollably for about four minutes. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head and she was foaming at the mouth. It was very unpleasant. I had no idea what I could do to help her, or even if I could help. So in today's video, I want to talk about what you can do to help someone who's having a seizure. And of course, the science behind seizures, because this is a science show after all. So to get started. Now you're in the car and you're driving. You have a destination to get to like all the cars around you. Now you get to a four-way intersection. Do you stop or do you zoom through it because you want to get to your destination as fast as possible? Well, the answer is of course you should stop because if you zoom through the intersection, a bunch of cars could slam into you and you'd have a gigantic collision. It'd be a massive traffic jam. There'd probably be an explosion like in the movies. The, the same thing happens pretty much in the brain. So the brain is a very complex system made up of millions of brain cells or neurons. And these neurons communicate with each other by sending electrochemical messages. Now the way it works in the brain is these neurons are all able to send their own messages to each other without really interfering with the messages of other neurons. So this happens in a pretty orderly fashion. However, occasionally abnormal behavior can occur that leads to a seizure. And this abnormal behavior is characterized by a massive amount of electrical discharge coming from neurons all over the brain. So there are two major categories of seizures that we can talk about. There are two major types of uh, abnormal electrical discharge that can occur in the brain. The first leads to a generalized seizure. And a generalized seizure is characterized by massive synchronized spontaneous electrical discharge occurring across both hemispheres of the brain. Now, generalized seizures include both tonic-clonic seizures and absence seizures. Now, a tonic-clonic seizure would have been what my teacher had experienced. It is characterized by a tonic phase in which the sufferer will go unconscious and disconnect from his or her surroundings. It is then characterized by a clonic phase in which the sufferer will stiffen and then shake uncontrollably for a period of anywhere from 30 seconds to 4 minutes. The tonic-clonic seizure is then followed by what is known as a post-dictal period in which the sufferer will be having slurred speech and will, may or may not be aware of the surroundings or responsive. Now the second major type of generalized seizures are absent seizure. And an absent seizure which commonly occurs in young children most commonly is when the sufferer will blank out or space out or stare in the space for a few seconds but otherwise return the normal cognitive activity. So now there's a second category of seizures which are partial seizures and partial seizures differ from generalized seizures in that the area of spontaneous discharge of massive discharge electrical discharge is occurring in a very localized region of the brain and there are two further subclasses of partial seizures which are simple partial seizures and complex partial seizures. Now since this occurs in a localized area of the brain, much of the sufferer's function is maintained. In, in, a, simple complex, in a simple partial seizure, this includes awareness, memory, and consciousness. Now if any of those three criteria are lacking, the sufferers experience what is called a complex partial seizure. So nomenclature aside, what can you do to help someone that is suffering a seizure? Well, unfortunately, there's not really much you can do. So what you want to do is you want to immediately remove anything that the person having a seizure could hurt themselves on because they're moving uncontrollably. They can slam their hand into something and break their hand. They can hit their head against something hard and damage their brain that way. So you want to move things out of the way. You want to see the best cradle them, cradle their head the best you can, make sure they're not hurting themselves. And you want to push them on the side a little bit so they're going to be on the side like this so that in the event of the cough of blood or the vomit the vomit is not then entering their lungs and blocking their airway causing suffocation then you have two problems on your hand now contrary to popular belief you do not you do do not want to put something in their mouth so people say you can swallow your tongue you can chill your tongue no you don't want to put something in their mouth 
First of all, putting something in someone's mouth while they're having a seizure risks a choking hazard for that person. If you put a spoon in someone's mouth, like a lot of people say to do, you can choke on the spoon. You don't want to do that. And you risk the chance of having your fingers bit off by uncontrollable jaw movement while trying to place something in the person's mouth. So just don't do that. Now, after a seizure, you want to monitor that person's breathing to make sure the respiration is occurring uh, normally. And then if the person had a particularly long seizure, or this is their first seizure, you want to seek medical attention. So now you may find that the person who had the seizure is suffering from a convulsive disorder, such as epilepsy, in which case they would speak to their physician to determine an appropriate course of action. Usually the prescribed anticonvulsive medications that uh, have to do with um, regulation of calcium ion and sodium ion channel movement in the neuron, which we actually talked about in our videos on uh, neurobiology. So um, I just wanted to make this brief video today to talk about something that affected me today less than 10 hours ago and hopefully share something with you. I hope you gained something from this video. And once again, thank you very much indeed for watching and please join us next week.